later on, like uh, Jim Polsky's Love is Letting Go of Fear is mm -hmm. based on The Course in Miracles. And I, I thought that there are only two emotions out there and all other emotions come from those two, meaning there's only love and fear love and, and fear. everything else mm -hmm. comes from that. We become more fully expressed beings, mind, body, and spirit, and that this is not something that is an off to the side. It's truly who we are. And so you said that you have these, uh, you connect to your light team. So I'd like you to explain. I know what you mean. <laughs> I'd like you to explain what your light team means. So my light team could be... I, I feel that it changes from time to time when you're talking to your light team. I, I feel that I always have guardian angels around me. My heavenly father is always with me and Lord Jesus Christ is always with me. I also think that uh, sometimes I'll call on my, um, my archangels, you know, especially when I'm flying, I do have a fear of flying. So I'm always mm -hmm. calling Archangel Michael and Archangel Raphael to be with me when I'm on my plane. I have this like ritual and it just calms me down. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's people that have passed on in my life. Um, so I think that it's a whole, I, the light team includes all of that. You know, the people that have passed on and in my life that want to be there for me in that moment. They might not be there for me the next time I call, maybe it, it, unless I want them to be, but there, you know, I feel that there are different angels and different light beings around me at different times based on what my spirit needs. I know that sounds a little woo-woo, but I believe that. <laughs> no, it doesn't to me at all. And and I think that that's, that's why I, I want to do this podcast is I, I want to make it more uh, acceptable and mainstream that speaking to God, speaking to the creator, speaking to your light team, this is part of who we are as, as beings navigating this physical experience. So why would we try to ignore something that is really the essence of who we are? And because I had the near-death experience and being on the other side, I know we are not the physical body, that we are the spiritual body having a physical experience. So why be in the physical body and ignore the whole spiritual aspect of who we are? Um, so I love this. This is what lights me up. This is the conversation that I want to dig deep into. It's yummy to me. So were you, uh, you talked about your parents and that they were spiritual people. Did you have any kind of religious foundation or was it all more of a, of a spiritual, just kind of an umbrella of a spiritual uh, foundation? Well, my father went to seminary school. You know, yeah, my dad did too. Yeah, I, you know, you and I have a lot of similarities. When, like when I read your books, well, now it's two but, uh, that I've read twice. <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, he went to seminary school, and but he never he never became a pastor. Um, when I was growing up, my parents are born again Christians, and they wanted me to experience the right uh, message, not the religion. They were really not about the religion. So for instance, we would typically go to a non-denominational church or belong to a non-denominational church. Uh, when I was, I was baptized Lutheran, and then we ended up becoming members of a, of a Methodist church in a, my small town. But if there was a message that uh, the priest in a Catholic, in the, our local Catholic church seemed to be delivering that re resonated and that my parents heard of, they would take me to the Catholic church and we would listen to what that priest had to say, which I, that was such a lesson in itself for me as a child growing up to be so inclusive and open in my listening I will say that as my parents grew older, not my father so much, but my mother, and I think I think it might be because she has had some anxiety issues. You know, she had a, she had a anxiety disorder that we 
realized in her later years. Um, and maybe that was it, but it, it's almost like her, her thought changed. She became more uh, rigid, rigid. Yeah, that's a great mm-hmm. word. You read my mind. Yes, she became much more rigid about, whereas I would come to her and say, I just read this great book by Louise Hay. You got to listen to this. And then she would read the book because I wanted to share it with her. And she'd come back and say, well, this is against the Bible. That's against the Bible. This is against versus my, you know, for me, I would read all about, you know, Buddhist teaching and, you know, and, and I felt that was because of, and, and Hinduism, anything, you know, because they all have great messages and great learning background. My father was still very open to that. I think because of, you know, all of the books and, and, and information that he allowed to seep into his being. My mother was horrified. And sometimes when she'd think that I'd be exposing myself and learning about something that was not per the Bible. And I felt that that just came about maybe at a later age in her. I'm I'm not sure. They've both passed on now, so I can't ask them. Well, you can. I can. <laughs> Part of my life. That's, that's for another conversation. <laughs> um, I do. Uh, I have one of my podcasts is with Shannon Torrance, who is a medium. So I think you might be interested in listening to her. Yeah. I've, I've heard it before, whereas often uh, as you get older, you kind of get to a point where you atrophy in a particular belief and that's it. And uh, that's why I think it's important for us to constantly be asking, you know, well, what if and honoring other people's opinions and where they are in their journey. Uh, I've constantly say this where I am right now is not where I was a year ago five, 10 years ago, or even yesterday. So you want to be in a space of flexibility in all areas of your life, right? And the spiritual as well. Now, the one thing that doesn't change is my connection to, and you plug in the name that's good for you, but creator, God, source, the divine universe, spirit, Jesus Christ, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever name is your connection that the area or the information around has evolved from being born and raised into, you know, Catholicism and then stretching beyond that and going out into the world and exploring all kinds of belief systems. Uh, And then coming back full circle, I I, I smiled at you when you talked about the Course in Miracles because the Course in Miracles – and and I talked about it actually uh, in Jamie Hosmer's podcast that that uh, came out today actually on the channel. It comes to you when it's meant to come to you, and that and I don't mean just the Course of Miracles, but whatever is coming to you, whether it's this information that we're talking about today in the podcast, that will either touch you now or it might you know might never, or it might be a seed for later. Right, take what resonates and leave the rest. But I love that, that your journey has really gone through its phases and it's brought to you to where you are today. And I love your morning ritual. Um, and you said that you look at, you have cards. I'm assuming these are oracle cards or tarot cards or um, I have a, a very worn deck here that I will use. Um, sometimes it's just a nice tool as a messenger, you talked about that as these are, these are messages because they're confirmations and being in this human form, we often need multiple confirmations. We doubt ourselves. We second guess that communication. Yeah. Have you ever had a very profound communication that was like, without a doubt, this was from the other side? You know, I, I, I have been getting them. Like I said, it, it, there's no accident when I'm li- the Course in Miracles workbook. It, for those people that are listening that don't maybe understand, the Course in Miracles is a book. It's written by several people that actually didn't even believe in the Bible. Mm-hmm. It, 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 so it's interesting what they took from it. And now, and there's so many studies on it, so many books about it later on, like 
uh, Jem Polsky's Love is Letting Go of Fear is mm -hmm. based on The Course in Miracles. And I, I thought that there are only two emotions out there and all other emotions come from those two, meaning there's only love and fear. Love and fear. Everything mm -hmm. else comes from that. So um, when I, I, I think when you, with meditation, I'm I'm going a little bit around, but it, 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 it'll come back around. So meditation, for instance, is a way to calm your mind, your monkey chatter mind, and allow quiet to come in so that you can get messages. And the, the more that you practice something and put it into practice, the more it, you, um, a person can, um, it, it sinks in, you know, anything experiential is going to sink in. And so you know, people are scared of meditation, but meditation can be five minutes. You know, your your beautiful waterfall chakra med <laughs> guided meditation mm -hmm. is six minutes, right? Yep. So I know because I've done it enough times. <laughs> uh, sometimes you need a guided meditation. And sometimes it's just breathing, you know, for a minute, breathing mm -hmm. slow, four counts in if that works, or five counts in slow and five counts out or four counts out. Just several breaths like that is important to quiet your mind and get messages. And, and learning to be present. Exactly. And listen to not your monkey chatter. Right. Of, oh my gosh, I need to make coffee for my husband or, oh my gosh, I need, you know, X, Y, Z is going to happen today. Or I can't get this out of my head from yesterday. And, you know, this song keeps on playing in my head over and over again. I can't get it out. I mean, after a while, you know, it, you're not doing meditation wrong if you can't get those things out of your head. It's just the more that you practice meditation, the more that you can listen and be quiet and hear what your light team, your messages from you know, Heavenly Father, where, wherever you want to call it, the universe is coming to you. And it's interesting to me, the more I've put into practice and gone through the Course in Miracles, for instance, for, you know, several years and, and, and whatever I did before then, the books that I've read and that these messages from the Oracle cards and the, you know, you know, like one is from Louise Hay, just those, mm -hmm. you know, the tabletop cards that give you messages, but I, but I shuffle them and, and, and ask my light team to give me a message and, and they just pop out and they pop out mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my God. So this one card is telling me about body care that I just kind of heard from the one sentence Course in Miracles message that I'm repeating to myself throughout the day. And the same from my angel cards that I did, you know, and it's, there's no accident with that. It is really yeah. speaking. Now, have I had any kind of um, otherworldly messages? There are times that I have in the middle of the night, been walking through the hallway, and, and all of a sudden, I've heard, "Hello," like, and I, and my cat walked by, and I'm no, it's not my cat, you know, but I'm doubting myself because I'm thinking I I have, I have my wild free brain, you know, my my artsy hippie <laughs> artsy ish brain. And I have a, a whole other side to me, as you know, that's very conservative, operational, um, you know, and, and all about logic. And my logic is trying to tell me that that can't have just happened. So I don't I'm, I don't get messages all of the time like some other people do. But yes, I've had some of those messages. Some of them have been guided through um, shaman during a, a um during a sweat lodge or two that I've been to, um, where we're we're opening up those portals to to have meditation in a different way, and so there are messages that come to you that way or have come to me that way anyway, um, and then there have been you know little visits like that, and then I poo poo them and say that can't have just happened. So I probably don't get as many visits as I would if my logical brain wouldn't turn it off. <laughs> well, doing the work that I do, I, I used to call myself a skeptic. Mm -hmm. Having a healthy, skeptical look, but also being open to the possibilities of things. And I've had so many experiences that now I'm no longer, I have, have that skepticism. 
And you're right as, ba- as far as meditation. And there are three main reasons why people don't meditate that I've heard over and over again over all these years of teaching meditation in the meetings industry. I yeah. love beginners. You know, you, you get into a room and all these beginners are kind of like, you know, oh, what's going to go on in here, right? <laughs> and then they see, oh, well, she looks normal, very grounded. And um, there are three main reasons that I have heard. One, I don't have enough time, right? And you just hit on the fact that it doesn't have to take, you don't have to sit crisscross applesauce for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. You can really do it for a couple of minutes and then, but it's about the consistency, So do it consistently every day at the same time is most helpful, and you will build a practice. The other one is I can't shut off the monkey mind. Well, you're not going to. I had a crazy monkey mind when I first started, you know, sitting down and making lists. And I'm, oh, I'm hungry. What am I going to have to eat? Oh, I need to get this done, right? My list had lists. Uh, But the more that you do it, the byproduct is the monkey mind starts to dissolve, And that's why you just keep showing up for yourself. And the third one is I'm not doing it right. And the fact that you're showing up for yourself, you're doing it right. That's why they call it a practice. So, right? It's not something to conquer, achieve, or overcome. It is a practice. And I love the meetings industry so much. And I have just been blessed to be able to be involved in so many people's lives on this journey because of the meetings industry. Right. If you're going to go global, which was the message that I had received when I had the the uh, wellness center, and you were instrumental in being that that connector from being a local place, even though we got international travelers and international teachers coming through there, I my message was that it was going to go global, and the global was doing global meetings and events and touching. Uh, people that were so stressed out. I the visual that I have is like the Peanuts character, Pigpen, with all the right, all the dust around him. I'm like, that's all static, and you can't get through the static with messages while you're carrying all of this around. And then what happens is you attract all that static because that's what you're vibing at. And so if you are highly stressed and you're, you know, carrying around all this trauma and drama around you and lots of chaos and obstacles, it's the static, it's the attraction of what you've got going on there. So the quickest way to move through that and dissolve that is through meditation and gratitude and getting out in nature. So the things that you are doing. You know, you just hit on a lot of really cool things I have to say again you know like this is about you now but I'm gonna talk about you now (laughs) (laughs) indulge me just for a minute um I before Lee Papa was conventions who tried to bring in some kind of wellness usually yoga so they were doing yoga in hallways outside of the convention hall or maybe in a corner of a convention hall or expo hall. And here are people in suits or dresses doing downward dog (laughs) and trying to love it. Right. (laughs) And that was what consisted of that. Um, So when we, when you introduced to the world through the international, huge international show of meeting organizers, IMAX America, and uh, Dale Hudson was the the catalyst. Oh, Dale. I love Dale. I got to get her on the show too. She um, she came to me because I would help her out with it. She she's one of those that thinks uh, in this ethereal up up here level, and then somebody else has to figure out, and then so she thinks up here in this ethereal level, and then somebody else needs to help her bring it into reality. You know, and so- I need to interject something about Dale as well, is that she also knew what it took, knows she's not gone, <laughs> she knows <laughs> what it takes to launch something new and allow it the time to grow roots and expand into what her vision was. So, Yeah, so she came to me and she said, and you've heard this story before, but I, I, I love telling it because it's so funny. Because <laughs> when you know Dale, it's really funny. She said, yeah, I'm thinking about some kind of expert that can think or speak kind of like energy, like 
Reiki kind of thing. Like Reiki, like she didn't even know what Reiki was, right? Like, so I said energy because I'm thinking that's not kind of how she described it. She's like, I think I want them to speak Reiki, but into a level that can get to the to the business person that they can accept it. And so that was the start. And then I started doing some research through friends like David Oliphant. He introduced me to you. Yeah. And you and I had this conversation and I'm like, oh yeah, she's the, she's the perfect person. But mm-hmm. you and I were talking about bringing meditation and wellness. And I knew that that was kind of what Dale was talking about, but she couldn't spit it out. Right. And so then the second year in, after introducing you, where you were doing the general session, you were doing the, um, the beautiful, you were doing also side um, meetings, uh, break breakout meetings as well. Mm-hmm. That's what I wanted to say, breakout mm-hmm. meetings. And then also the wellness lounge, the, the mm-hmm. meditation lounge. Mm-hmm. That thing got so popular that there were like 40 people in the waiting room, which you did. It was a beautiful setup, even just the waiting room. And then inside was a beautiful setup that just set the tone for the med- meditation room. And there were 40 people in there. And it was consistently busy. And the general session, by the end of that convention, after three days, I was hearing as I'm walking through the aisles of these thousands upon thousands of meeting planners from all around the world about meditation. They never knew. And they were like, we want meditation like that, like a a meditation room on our convention. And that's it. So you had this goal of wanting to reach the world. It wasn't about you. It was, you were just happy if somebody was using someone else as a meditation uh, expert on the, in their convention, you're happy that at least they, they brought that. Thousands. Yeah. Like, if you don't like my meditation, don't blame meditation. Go into, you you know, go into Insight Timer, find what works for you. Um, but thank you for that. Um, it, it brings me back. <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh, thank you for bringing that. To- it really has been a joy. Uh, and I, I thank you. I thank Dale because you two really, uh, and David, of course, were were instrumental. You were the reasons why that all launched. And, um, and look what and- we did. We opened up a whole different view. Yeah. Not that yeah. meditation wouldn't come to the world anyway you know, eventually, but who knows, you know, it's one step at a, that's why one, even one minute of somebody's time can affect someone else for the rest of their life. That's why being so aware in the moment when you're talking to somebody, whether it's a young budding um, leader that's on their, on their trajectory in, in business or, you know, even a two-year-old or a, a, an 80-year-old, you know, like, like one, you could say something in one minute that you have no idea has affected them the rest of their life. And then that legacy lives on because that they in turn pass it along and on and on and on. It's a ripple so, effect for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's why um, the light team guided me to the meetings and industry because I had heard global for over a year and I thought I was supposed to open up wellness centers all over the world. And I was like, I don't know how that's going to happen. But uh, the global message, because how brilliant to bring mindfulness and which is non-judgment. Mindfulness equals awareness of your thoughts and actions in the world around you in non-judgment. Coupling that with meditation, so quieting the mind enough to be able to listen to your inner guidance, and then being able to shift meeting planners and people within the industry that get to touch so many lives. Think about how many lives have been changed. Like you say, this ripple effect is, um, it's incredible and uh, just so blessed, so grateful to be on this journey um, with you, with all of us on the planet in this time of great change, because we all feel it. Don't you feel that there's something just extraordinary happening? I, it's like the- I really feel that there is so much potential out there. I think 
for, for several different reasons. Number one, there, there are a couple of things that I wanted to touch on that meetings and event industry touches every industry in the world. So when you've opened the eyes, and I say you because you have, you've been a huge impact of meeting planners globally, you're touching every industry, the car industry, the oil industry, the nursing, doctor industry, and they're in their conventions and what they've done and how they've opened up to mindfulness and wellness in their conventions and touched those individual professionals' minds and then on and on into their organizations, the attendee and exhibitor organizations, in, and it just trickles down. And I think we're in a, in a, one of my favorite sayings is always have a sense of wonder. So if you always have a sense of wonder and curiosity, knowing that you're the one thing is, and the other favorite statement I'm going to say is to remind yourself that you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And because there is, I mean, I know I love the name of your book, all knowing, and that's for a whole different reason, (laughs) but we don't know. And when you start, when, when you, when you think you are right about something and you're stubborn about what you're thinking on, you're not going to open up and have that sense of wonder. I think some of the things that have helped us shook shook the world up. A couple two th- two things recently. The pandemic, I think, has opened up people's eyes because there were so many things that have been affected by the pandemic. And I'm not, um, you know, I, n- nobody expected that to happen. It was so unexpected. Mm-hmm. The other thing is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. It's the only thing that has changed is, is all of a sudden chat GPT came about a year ago and exploded. And now people have this artificial intelligence conversation and they're afraid of it. Stay with us for part three, where we discuss fears, the power of our words, feeling safe and celebrated, how to be empowered by quieting our mind and navigating our light team, as well as last words of wisdom from Erica. Be sure to like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell.